Good evening, everyone. Welcome. If we haven't met, my name's James. I'm one of the pastors here. In January this month, we're spending four weeks looking at the topic of wrestling with God. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at four different characters in the Bible who wrestle with God. Tonight, we're going to look at Jacob, then Habakkuk, then Jonah, and lastly, Paul. And then at the start of term one, we're going to be in a series looking at the final five or so chapters of Luke's gospel. So that's where we're headed this year. Um, if you've got a Bible, please open it to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. I'm going to read from verse 22 to 32. All right, here we go. That same night, Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the men saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Yeah, what a strange passage. All right, let's pray. Let's ask for God's help as we make sense of this together. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace to us in Jesus. Thanks for your word that it speaks to us. We pray tonight that you'd help us to wrestle well, that you'd give us the humility to confess our need for you, uh, that you'd help us to see that, that you are the greatest blessing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this is a strange passage in the Bible. You've got a significant biblical character, Jacob, wrestling with a mysterious man who in the end we find out is God. Now, I don't, it might not surprise you, I don't wrestle much, right? I, I have not wrestled for a long time. I mean, I, I wrestle with my kids, but it's not really wrestling, it's just me dominating them. Um, and as a kid, I wrestled with my brother a lot, but that was just him dominating me. But I reckon most of us, maybe even all of us, have at some point in time wrestled in one way or another with God. Probably not physically, like Jacob, but I, I more mean spiritually, a wrestle of soul, of mind, of emotions with God. Maybe you've wrestled with God because of unmet longings in your life and in your heart. Maybe it's been a season of significant suffering where you wonder what God is doing. Maybe it's a whole bunch of intellectual questions that you have about the goodness of God or problems that make it hard for you to have faith in Jesus. What is clear is that I, I think in Christian communities like ours, we, we wrestle with wrestling. And, and here's what I mean by that. Sometimes in Christian community, we, those of us who are Christians, can get the idea that wrestling is somehow bad, like asking questions, expressing doubts, wonderings, longings. Like there's this pressure sometimes in Christian communities to just show up to church and look good and smile and pretend like everything is okay. Have you ever felt that? that pressure in church life. And when others have questions, we, we, we can feel anxious or uncomfortable about the questions. We can feel like, oh, they're slipping away from the faith. So the best thing for us to do is shut those questions down. <laughs> you know, tell people to just read their Bible and pray and then everything will magically be all right. Tell them just to have faith, which can come from a really good place, but it's, it's, it's really unhelpful. And what I want to suggest to you tonight, it's also really, like, it's unbiblical. Alternatively, those of us who are Christians as we share the gospel, sometimes we can distort the gospel as we share it. We mislead people when we say things like following Jesus is really easy and it'll make your life better in every way. Um, the truth is actually following Jesus is, is hard. The Bible describes it as the narrow path. 
It's totally worth it. Jesus is worth every loss. But we make people think that being a Christian makes everything better and fixes everything. And so when they find themselves in a place of struggle, a place of wrestle, it almost feels wrong to admit that that's what's going on. Coming to faith is often a very intense wrestle. See, any relationship of substance will eventually involve conflict, won't it? You get close enough to a person, you're gonna end up disagreeing with them if you wanna grow in intimacy. Um, over the years, I've done plenty of marriage prep with couples who are getting married, and occasionally I'll have a couple come across and they'll say, yeah, we don't ever fight. And they wear it as like a badge of honor, like we never fight, we never have conflict. And they think I'm gonna be really impressed by that, but inside I'm thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> something is going wrong here. You see, how do you, how do you really get to know someone if they never disagree with you? How do you really get to the soul of a person if they're not willing to share themselves with you even when they disagree with you? And Christianity, fundamentally, it's, it's a relationship with God. Christ dies in our place for our sin. He rises from the dead. We go from being enemies of God to having peace with God to being in relationship. In fact, the Bible will use the language of adoption. We, we become children of God. And, and the images of God's people in the New Testament... Christ's body, which is intimately connected, right, to Christ, and the language of being the bride of Christ, his, his bride. These are images of closeness and intimacy. All of which means if you're a Christian and want relationship with God, it will involve a wrestle. And if you're not a Christian and are thinking through relationship with God, you need to, you need to know that it's going to involve a wrestle, so we've, we've got some wrestling to do tonight. Let, let's start by making sense of this very strange story, and then we'll step back and think about wrestling more generally. So th this passage is actually the center point, I think, of the Jacob narrative in the book of Genesis. It's the most significant moment in his life. If you don't know the story, let me give you some quick background. Jacob, he is the son of Israel, who is the son of Abraham. He was born alongside a twin, so he's the younger of the twins. His name means he clutches at the heel, because when he was born, he, he came out, I suppose, like that, holding onto his brother's heel. But the name Jacob, he clutches at the heel, actually, it's a turn of phrase that means he's a deceiver, he's a cheat, he's a liar. His older brother's name was Esau. And while the two of them were in their mother's womb, a word from the Lord came to Rebecca, their mum, and said, the older will serve the younger, which goes against the grain of ancient Near East culture. It's always the oldest who gets the blessing. It's the oldest to whom the promises are supposed to come. But God says, no, 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 my promise to Abraham, to Isaac, will go to Jacob and not Esau. And as Jacob grows up, it turns out that he's not just Jacob by name, but he's Jacob by nature. So his brother comes in starving for food and Jacob has made some food and Jacob says, I'll give you the food if you give me your birthright. And he's like, what good is it if I die to have the birthright? And Jacob said, you're not getting the food unless you sell me your birthright. And he does. So Esau despises his birthright in that sense. And then later, he dresses up as his brother to trick his very elderly blind father to give him the blessing. You see, Esau was like daddy's boy. He, he was the favorite of, of Isaac. Jacob was the favorite of his mother, Rebecca. And Rebecca and Jacob hatch a plan and he steals the birthright. And, and at the end of that story, Esau comforts himself by saying, when dad dies, I'll kill Jacob. And so Jacob runs for his life. Now, there's a bunch of chapters where he has a deal with his uncle Laban and marries some women and then sort of marries two other women to have more and more children. But at this point in the story, he's just fled from his uncle Laban. And at the start of, in chapter 31, God tells him to go home and that he'll be with him, which is a dangerous instruction from God. Go home, back towards your brother who wanted you dead. And God says that I'll be with you. He gets to the end of the promised land, at the edge of the promised land at the start of chapter 32, and he's met by angels and calls the place God's camp. He sends word to Esau that he's coming, and he really butters it up. 
Like he describes himself to Esau as your servant. Remember the prophecy, the older will serve the younger, and yet Jacob sends word to Esau, your servant is coming, your servant is seeking your favor. He's basically saying, please don't kill me. And when the messenger comes back from Esau, he says, Esau is coming towards you with 400 men. And so Jacob freaks out. Like, it, he's so overwhelmed and scared. He thinks Esau's coming to kill him and his wives and his children. He prays a desperate prayer. He, he, he then splits his camp up and he starts sending gift after gift after gift, hoping that, like, ten different gifts will make Esau change his mind as he's on the way about, about killing him. And it's in this moment of crisis where Jacob prays. Now, some commentators look at Jacob and they go, the fact that he prays and then does all these scheming, sneaky things to try and make Esau well disposed to him means that he doesn't really have faith. I don't quite buy that. I don't think faith just means you do nothing. I think faith and wisdom go together. But he sends his family across the river and if you look, he crossed the ford of the Jabbok River He sends them across with everything else he has. And in verse 24, he's alone. Um, This is where the passage gets even more strange. We get introduced to a man who shows up with him and wrestles with him through the night, a whole night long wrestle. Now in Hebrew, there's a bit of a play on words going on here. That's worth knowing about. So in Hebrew, Jacob is, is Jacob and he crosses the river Yabok. And the word for wrestle is Wayabek. So there's Yaakov, Yabok, Wayabek. Now, what is the point of that? I think it's actually meant to highlight two things. It's going to highlight two big themes for us in this passage. One is the theme of name. So name's going to be really significant. And the other is wrestling. So if we, if we want to draw meaning out of this passage, by highlighting that play on words, we're meant to look for anything to do with name and anything to do with wrestling. Now, a fair question is, who is the man? Because at the end of the passage in verse 30, if you have a look, Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. And we, we know that describing a God as a man seems wrong in the Old Testament, because God is not a man. Most scholars would say Jacob's right, this is God, that uh, this is what they call a theophany. It's the idea where God shows up in some kind of form to reveal something about himself. In verse 25, it says that when the man saw he did not prevail over Jacob, and that makes me go, hang on, if this man is God, why is he not prevailing over Jacob? This is the one who spoke universes into existence with a word, and he's just like, he's struggling with Jakey boy? Like, what's going on here? I don't think it's that God couldn't beat him, because do you notice what happens when It says, he saw that he could not prevail over him, and then he just touches him on the hip, and his leg is dislocated. It doesn't say that he punched him or wrenched his leg out. He just goes, bang, and his, his hip is dislocated. Must mean that God is limiting his strength for the wrestle. And it's worth imagining this. Like, this wrestle seems to go on for a really good chunk of the night, I think I could wrestle someone if my life was on the line for like 10 to 15 minutes. And I think after that, I'd just be spent, like absolutely cooked. This goes on and on. There's serious physical strain and exhaustion. On top of that, there's a dislocated leg. I have not dislocated my leg. I don't know what that is like, but I have dislocated my shoulder. And oh my goodness, when I think about the pain of that dislocation, it just makes me feel sick. Like, I don't think the conversation went as I read it. You know, what is your name? Jacob. I think he wrenched that between gritted teeth. I think he was clinging for life. I think when he said, please bless me, he did not say, please, Lord, bless me. I I think he was in a world of pain. And yet Jacob won't let go. Why won't he let go of this guy? I think the answer is because he's figured out who it is. He's figured out that this is not just some, this is not Esau who's shown up in the night to take him, that he's actually wrestling with God. And you might wonder, why does God need to ask Jacob his name? Surely he he knows that. God never needs to ask anyone anything, does he? Like when has God ever asked a question for the sake of information? Never. 
This is a kindness and mercy of God. And Jacob, in saying his name, this is a moment of confession. He's, he's revealing something about his character. See, Jacob is admitting that he's a Jacob, a cheat, a deceiver. And he gets a new name. He's called Israel, which could either mean he struggles with God uh, or it could mean that God struggles for him. But what is strange is that God says to him, your name is now Israel, for you've struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. I find that strange. Yeah? Like if, if we had a wrestling match after church and at the end of it, one person had a dislocated leg and the other didn't, who would you say won? Would you say, would you say the person with the dislocated leg that's popped out of their hip joint won? Like, it's weird. He's, he's prevailed despite the dislocation. That's odd. We'll come back to that. Jacob asks for the name of the man and doesn't get it, but he does receive a blessing and he changes the name of the place which indicates that he he realizes that he was face to face with God in the dark and yet because of God's mercy and grace to him he didn't die what is clear is that from this moment on in Jacob's life something dramatic has changed and it's not just that he's going to walk with a limp for the rest of his life right there was no good out of hospital patient care in these days where he'd get really good physio treatment to fix the leg. He's, he, he's going to walk with a limp for the rest of his days. But how he relates to God changes fundamentally. Now, we could spend more time. We'll dig into different parts of the story. But let, let's step back and reflect on what this story might teach us. Now, there is an assumption here tonight. I, I'm assuming that you will agree with me, and maybe you don't, and that's okay. Hopefully, by the end, you might. I'm assuming that to be a Christian means wrestling with God. That God names his people Israel would suggest that wrestling with God is fundamental to belonging to the people of God. And so what I want to do is think about what that means and what that looks like to wrestle well. And if after tonight you want to explore this more, let me encourage you, go search. There's a great Tim Keller sermon on this passage that's way better than what I'll do. But anything good in here, I probably nicked from him. All right, so... Let let, let me show you four things about wrestling well. Here's the first one. Wrestling with God must be personal. It's got to be individual. So have a look with me at verse 24. Jacob was left alone. Here's a man who grew up knowing about God. If you have some Christian pedigree in your family, Jacob's granddaddy was Abraham. Like his is just better than ours. He knew about the promises of God. But he was a liar and a cheat and a schemer. And if you look at how he speaks of God, in chapter 32, he talks of God as the God of my father Abraham and the God of my father Isaac. And it's only after he wrestles with God and is delivered from Esau that he calls God his God. He sets up an altar at the end of chapter 33 called God, the God of Israel. Before, he was scheming and controlling, and he was trying that with God and people after it is changed. So here's a question for reflection for us. Is your faith yours? You might have heard this phrase, have you ever heard this phrase, God doesn't have any grandchildren? Have you ever heard that before? It's the idea that God only has children, not grandchildren, which means... If Christianity is fundamentally about a relationship with God, a personal relationship with him, that means that just because your parents are Christians or just because you go to youth group or you're a youth leader or you went on beach mission or your dad's a pastor or whatever it is, just because of those things, that doesn't mean that you're a Christian. See, Jacob believed in God. He was religious. He set up altars previously. He prayed, but he completely misunderstood God. And so it's worth pausing, especially for those of us who've grown up in church and belong to a Christian community. When you're alone before God, who are you? Do you love him? Is Christianity something that you do? Or are you in a relationship with God? Are you just part of the people of God because they're the people you hang out with? Have you ever wrestled with him? 
Um, can, can I encourage you, if this makes you feel unsettled and if you're not sure where you stand with God, if you actually look at your life and go, I go through the religious motions, but me alone before God, I don't have much to say, I'm not real interested in him. And if that troubles you at all, can I just encourage you, that's really great news. Like the wrestle has begun. Well done. <laughs> wrestle with God, with who he is and who you are as you stand before him. Give some time to search your heart and pray. And it's worth thinking for all of us, are you ever alone with God? There, there are seasons of life where it's really hard. You know, like have a kid. They just never go away. And they take up all your time. And having good, quiet time where you've got time to read and pray and reflect, it's hard. And some of us, we have particular bents. Like personally, I, I can say I, I find uh, reading the Bible quite easy. That's not a strain for me. It's years of ingrained habit. But put me alone before God where I have to pour my heart out in prayer and I find that I have to work at that so much more. It just doesn't come as naturally. Uh, who are you alone before God? So often we can just want to get to the next thing. We're more like Martha and less like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Let me encourage you, start of a new year, get alone with God, make it a habit so that you can wrestle. So wrestling well, it, it's a personal thing. You've you got to do it yourself. That's the first one. Here's the second thing to think about wrestling. It has to be true wrestling. Now, look at verse 24. They spend hours of the night trying to gain mastery over the other. This will sound like a boast, but it's not, because look at me. Like, when I wrestle my two youngest boys, I smash them. Not literally. Okay, this is going on the internet. Like, I'm very, I love my children. But it's not a fair fight. Because I'm, I'm just bigger and stronger. Even my two older boys, some of you know I'm Sam and Tom. Like they, Sam's about up to here on me. I reckon I got him for maybe a year or two more. And then like something's going to change and I'm going to get humbled. You may still be wondering, what do I mean by wrestling with God? Like, the obvious meaning is struggling, fighting. It's, it's working through our doubts, our questions, our anger, our grief. It's asking hard, unanswerable questions. It's following in the footsteps of some of the greats of the Bible, like Job or Habakkuk or Jeremiah. Some of us really struggle to do that. It feels wrong. But remember what I said earlier, just as a marriage without conflict can't grow in intimacy, so too with God. And my worry is that some of us wrestle with God like I might wrestle with my youngest boy. He's three. It's really easy for me to wrestle with him and he'll never lay a glove on me, really, unless I let him. Here's what I mean by that. Our wrestle with God sometimes is one-sided. We've got all of the questions. We push and we shove, but we're not willing to let God have his say in our life. Here's what that might look like. It could be the Christian who doesn't like what the Bible says about a particular topic, so they just write it off. It could be a Christian who ignores explicit truths because it doesn't suit. It, it could be the skeptic wrestling through the big questions of the Christian faith, but does it with a posture of authority over God where you only believe what you want to or you only believe what you like if it fits with your worldview. Now, here's a big problem with that. If you have a God who can't ever disagree with you, then who's the God in that relationship? Who's in charge? The truth is, you are. That's just no God at all. And therefore, your God will be limited to your ethics, beliefs, and ideas. It means that it'd be like wrestling with a toddler. It's just really easy. Just write off the things that you don't like because your God never, ever gets a punch in. And ultimately, it's dishonest if you're not ever willing to have God push back. Uh, I wonder, Christian, is that you? When was the last time that your God disagreed with you? Um, some of us feel God's disagreement all the time. Maybe you're one of those people who just, just feel like God's angry with you constantly. Um, I, I just want to remind you of God's grace. It, it's so good. He's so kind and so merciful. He asks questions. I'm probably more making this point to those of you who say that you're Christians and yet God has not disagreed with you at any point in the last few months or years. 
Is that because you're just so unbelievably godly (laughs) that God would never dare to disagree with you? Or is it that you're not really wrestling? I wonder a dangerous prayer to pray tonight is, God, would you disagree with me and so change me? So wrestling's personal. It's it's two-way. Here's the next thing. It really just flows out of that one. Wrestling with God must be honest. Have a look at verse 27 with me. He said, the man God says to Jacob, what is your name? And he says, Jacob. I I love that because God's really not asking his name. He's asking who he is. And when Jacob, with leg dislocated in a world of pain, there's this moment of beautiful honesty where he says, this is who I am. I'm a cheat. I'm a deceiver. I'm a schemer. I'm a liar. And I just love the kindness of God. Because God could have said, pop, hey, you're a cheat, aren't you? And then Jacob in his pain, like, oh, yeah, I guess so. But God asks questions. So often in the Bible, God asks questions of people. Like, where are you, he asked to Adam and Eve. We'll, We'll see it in Jonah. He asked Jonah questions. And he asked questions so that we might benefit, that we might reflect, that we might see something about ourselves that we hadn't otherwise seen. It's clearly God's plan that Jacob's going to inherit the promises of God. So you might go, oh, but hang on. All these bad things that Jacob did, that that was God's plan, yes. But it's also very clear that how Jacob lived his life was completely in opposition to God's nature and character. He's guilty of his sinful ways. And in this moment, wretched with pain, he's honest about who he is. It's true that no relationship can grow without honesty. The couple who never fight aren't being honest. They're not in a real relationship. They're, I mean, Marty would say they're in marketing, right? (laughs) Like they're just, they're just lying about who they are. And the Christian life is meant to be one of honest confession about who we are, both the good and the bad. Like how do you become a Christian? You become a Christian by confessing your need to God, by recognizing that you don't love God as you should. You don't love others as you should. Um, The Bible word for it's repentance. It's recognizing that something needs to change. And it flows not from the reality of God as judge, but as a response to his kindness and grace in Christ. But here's the truth. A lot of us, we struggle to be honest. And I I just want to encourage you, the cross gives us all that we need to grow in our capacity to be honest. Because think about it. The cross is this very clear picture that we don't have it together, that our sin is far worse than we think. If the Son of God had to enter and live a perfect life for us and be crucified on our behalf, bearing the wrath of God in our place, clearly our sin's a big deal. We've got to be honest. But at the same time, the cross reminds us that God's love for us is so big, so great, that he would gift his Son for us. We're more loved than we realised. It gives us what we need to be honest. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, can I just encourage you, the message of the gospel is not sort your life out and then God will love you. The message of the gospel is God loves you. Come to him because he's so gracious and kind. He doesn't wait for Jacob to sort his life out, to make promises to him and to keep promises to him. He's so gracious. And for those of us who are Christians, can I I encourage you, God is so much more kind than you realise which should grow in us a capacity to be honest about our own wrestles, about our struggles, and about the areas of our life where we're stuck in patterns of sin. It gives us the ability to confess them, knowing that God's not going to turn his face away from us. He already knows and he still loves us. So wrestling's personal, two-way, and honest. Here's the last one. Uh, Wrestling with God well means winning by losing. Or to put it another way, it, it means embracing weakness. Um, And I want to say, I think this is the most challenging part of wrestling and something we're going to come back to over the following weeks. But think about this. Jacob, it's dark. His leg is popped out of its socket. He's clinging to God and begging for blessing. Can I tell you what I would be begging for in that moment? Please fix my leg. (laughs) I think that's what I would be begging for. But he's begging for blessing from God. I think in that moment, he realizes that what he needs more than safety from Esau 
or a comfy life is God himself. And the new name, I think, is intentionally ambiguous. So Israel, it says, we're going to call you, I'm going to call you Israel because you've struggled with God and men and prevailed. And then he limps off and it doesn't really look like he's prevailed. I mean, he didn't die. But the name can mean he fights or struggles with God. Or it can mean God fights either with you or for you. And so you've got to ask the question, which is it? What does his name mean? Does it mean that God fights for Jacob? Yes. That's the story of his life. God keeps coming through for him despite the fact that he's a scumbag. Does it also mean that Jacob and the people of God fight with God? Yes. You know the, if you know the history of Israel, you know that it is a constant wrestle and struggle between God and his people. So how does God say that Jacob prevailed? I think he limps away a winner because he got God. And that limp would serve as a reminder for the rest of his life of the power of the one who he fought with and the power of the one who fights for him. If, if you go back to chapter 28, Jacob prays this awful prayer, <laughs> if a prayer can be awful. He says to God, God, if you bring me back to the land of my fathers and give me what I want, then you'll be my God. <laughs> what a prayer. I mean, how many of us have prayed that? I've prayed that kind of prayer. God, if you take away this problem that I have created myself, then I'll be a really good boy, right? Like that's essentially what he prays. And yet now with a limp, Having met God, you get to the end of chapter 33 and he builds an altar and calls it God, the God of Israel. He, he embraces weakness and dependence. And he, he embraces this new identity founded on grace because he calls the altar God, the God of Israel, as opposed to God, the God of Jacob. And I wonder, will we, will you embrace weakness and dependence? Will you embrace the new identity that's gifted to you because of God's grace? Now, here's, here's what that might look like. Will you confess your controlling ways or your reliance on your strength? This is harder. Will you embrace your limps, your pains, perhaps even as a gracious gift from a loving father? Will you reorder your aspirations and goals for your life so that your life is less about conforming to Western ideals of money, wealth, success, comfort, pleasure, and make seeing his face delighting in him more your goal? That's hard, isn't it? Like, how do you embrace the limps of your life? How do you embrace the really hard, painful things when you feel like God has inflicted you? How do you get honest? Well, it's really hard to be honest. How do you deal with the fact that God disagrees with you and everything in you wants to tell him he's wrong? See, so often our Jacobish ways are our defaults. Here's, here's one thing that's so helpful. I think a starting place, if you want to embrace weakness or dependence, if you want to make any of this possible in your life, it starts by remembering the better and greater Jacob the better and greater Israel. Like, think about this. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane wrestles with God, doesn't he? Father, take this cup from me. And then he says, but not what I will, but what you will. And the greater Jacob didn't walk away from that with a limp. He got crucified. And what's even more interesting is that when Jesus rose from the dead... What did he say to his disciples to prove who he was? Did he say, look at my perfect resurrection body, check out my abs? Like he didn't. He, he said, look at my scars. You know what that means? It means that his scars were his glory. We remember and put our faith in him and let his love and grace and kindness to us be the thing that slowly changes our hearts grows our capacity to be honest, to embrace weakness. See, I wonder, could it be, like with Jacob and Jesus, that our scars, our limps, our weaknesses, 
Could it be that they're the means of God to make us more humble, more beautiful, more glorious, more like him? Like, I realise that's very hard to hear, particularly if you are in the throes. So, like, if Jacob's got his leg hanging out wrestling with God and I happened to be there and I walked up to him and said, hey, Jakey boy, I know you're in a lot of pain right now, but listen, that limp is going to bring glory in your life. Like, it'd be fair enough if he let go and punched me, yeah? So I recognise that if you're in the heat of it, this, this might not feel the most helpful thing. Sometimes the pain is so deep, sometimes it's hard to fathom how God can bring good out of the worst of things. But the cross helps us to imagine. The resurrected Jesus with his scars help us to imagine that the things we would never choose for our lives and ourselves, the wrestles that we have with God, could be precisely the things that God uses to make us more beautiful, more like Christ. Because more than Jacob, who became Israel, you and I, if you're a Christian, have a new identity built on grace. We... Our name becomes Christian. It becomes child of God. It becomes beloved. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at a few more figures from the Bible. My hope is that you'll wrestle, that we as a church will wrestle together, and that we would be the kind of place where it's okay to show up and say, I really struggle with this. I find this hard. I struggle with believing this about God. I think more honest and open conversation is only going to be helpful in us encouraging one another and helping us to grow one another. See, you don't actually have to pretend. And even though I said that wrestling with God is something that each of us have to do individually, it's also worth remembering that the picture of the church in the New Testament is always corporate, which means even as we wrestle with God individually, we don't have to do it alone. It means that we have the privilege of walking alongside each other in our wrestles with our limps, limping together, binding each other's wounds, helping to carry the limping person when they can't walk by themselves. It's easy to rejoice with one another while we rejoice. It's a bit more challenging to weep together. And my hope tonight is that you leave here thinking, I need to cling hold of God and ask for blessing. And by that, I don't mean more of the stuff you want in your life. I really mean that we would cling to God and ask that we would know him and delight in him more and more. Only when we do that will our limps and our scars make us more beautiful. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for this passage, this weird passage in the Bible where you wrestle with Jacob. We thank you for you your grace to him, and even more so for your grace to us. I pray that you'd help us to wrestle with you, that for those of us who might tonight realise that we're more religious and less in a relationship with you, that we would come before you alone and with honesty and ask for more grace. I pray you'd give us a greater capacity to hear the hard things that you have to say to us. Thank you that you're so loving that you disagree with us. And I pray that you'd help us to be honest and em- embrace the beautiful reality that Jesus conquers death by losing, by being crucified for us, and that we too might embrace our own weakness and even embrace the pains and limps of our lives as your severe mercies that you'll use to grow us more and more in the likeness of your Son. Lord, for those of us who really struggle all the time to believe that you really do love us, I pray you'd give us an experience of your love. For those of us who can't remember the last time you disagreed with us, I pray your spirit would convict us. And I pray that like Jacob, we would cling to you and long to delight in you more and more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.